Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, at the conference. Um, I'm Gaspar Spaniolo, uh, here student at Free. Um, also, DragonSec member. Uh, we, with the boys and a few girls, are basically um, hacking almost every weekend, uh, meeting up on Discord or maybe on the faculty every few months or weeks. Depends on the on the period of year. Um, so, what actually what do we do at the DragonSec? Um, we basically play mostly CTFs. Uh, there are web challenges uh, like you will see today, and uh, forensics, um, pawn, and web, and stuff like that. I don't know what else is. Uh, crypto, crypto, I forgot the crypto. The weird guys, mathematicians. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's firstly start. Uh, with questions. Um, how many of you have already played a bit with Linux? A bit late. Okay, cool, cool. Most of you. Perfect, perfect. So then it's cool. Uh, how many of you have you already heard about Ansible? Damn, okay. Perfect, cool. So then we are ready then. Um, let's start by looking at the file permissions in the user bin. Um, what is in the user bin usually? Binaries. Um, should there be anything dangerous for possible to attackers um, to exploit or something like that in the binaries? What should we check? Um, usually, we should check if there, are, if there is a right permission. If somebody writes uh, something into uh, the script, like cat, it can modify it, the cat script, let's say, and then uh, um, just put a reverse shell in the cat command and basically um, write the, the reverse shell to your machine. Um, so we should always check if uh, file permissions in the slash bin directory are correct. Basically, here we are checking if the group or user has write permissions in the uh, bin binary binaries uh, folder. And if he does it, we check it with uh, find. Um, nothing too special here. Um, so we started with file permissions. Then how do we check statistics of statistics of files or stats. Um, we basically see here all the access modified bits, uh, which device it is, when it was birth, uh, when it was written firstly, and something like that. This is just a few introduction slides. Um, okay, so to elevate uh, users on the Linux machines, we usually use the sudo command. Uh, in the and configuration for the sudo uh, can be accessed using the vsudo command. We basically first specify which editor do we want to use. Let's say vim because we are pure Linux users. Oh no, permission denied. Let's quickly do that. Um, Tor it's vim. And here is the configuration file for, Visu, for sudo. Uh, basically, here we can see that the root has all the permissions. He can do anything he wants on our system. Uh, and then for the wheel users, we, here it is because it's my VM, it's not defined, but for wheel, for wheel users, we add usually some users to the wheel group so that they can execute um, our uh, root command without uh, changing the user. Uh, we should always check in the other um, directories if there is some, maybe some malicious user that possibly has written the, here uh, that he has root access, so we should always check the, this file to see if everything is correct, uh, if any malicious user is mm, entered inside or something like that. 
Um, we should avoid this. Um, then on Linux systems, we have also the init system. Yeah, but that's the thing that boots up our system. Uh, it's the first process that starts on our system. Um, basically handles all the services and all the logs for the services. Um, we can check the logs by executing command. Well, let's check from the boot. And we can see all the boot messages from uh, the machine. We can see all the ACPI messages and stuff like that. Here it is. This journal CTL is basically used for debugging of our uh, Linux systems. Um, we can see um, all the possible um, all the possible printouts from all m possible programs, and then we can basically also uh, also specify which service we want to check or the chef flag, uh, which means that we will follow this process um, while it's printing its logs and like that. Um, then we have on Linux systems also where the users are stored. Stored, uh, uh, we can check all these files basically. What's inside of them? Uh, if we check Etsy password, we can see that here are all the system users in our system. Um, we can see root is specified here. So basically, first the username, his ID. Um, then here it is. Um, yeah, here it is his group ID, uh, home directory, and login shell. Um, here we can see some of the users have no login shell or basically been false. This is that the, these users don't have shell uh, and stuff like that. Then basically. With the password file, we also have the shadow file. What's in the shadow file? In the shadow file, we have um, hashed passwords of the users. So basically, if we check password, we can no, shadow. Sorry. In the shadow, we can see here hashed user of the uh, root, hash password of the root user uh, and. His username, hash password, and here we have we salt, I think, in the front of it, uh, this, uh, because of the hashing. Um, usually, we change this uh, Etsy password to immutable flag so that it cannot be deleted or edited or anything like that for security reasons. Um, we should also check the restrictions to the system directories in the boot directory to own only, only restricted to owners um, of the, that have permissions to write there or anything like that. Um, devices, we, here we can see that uh, here in the temp directory I did HMOD 1777. What does that one in front of 1777 mean? Uh, one means that only the user that created this file can also edit it and no one else. No one else can touch that file. Um, so it's a little bit uh, re more restricted than usual. Um, in the boot directory, why would we protect the boot directory? Because there we have kernel images and stuff like that. Um, kernel modules and Anything that comes around with devices, yeah, we should also protect them, shared memory also. Um, now to the fun part. Um, on some systems, not, not on some systems, um, we can have binary, basically, that uh, has, we can enable suite bit to binary. What that means is that if we enable suite bit to that binary, uh, user, if I am, let's say, Branco, and the owner of the file, I don't know, this DSEC file is root, 
and I run it as Branco, then this file will be run, run as root because it has suite bit enabled. That means that we can basically escalate privileges with user Branco. Um, what this means? Um, here, here you can see the flag, and this means that basically, if I'm a malicious user, I can execute anything I want. Uh, one example of that uh, is like find command. We can use it. It, it. It's really funny because we can set suite bit on the find command and then execute any other command we want with it. Basically, if we go find. Um, the type f and the she name. Let's search for all the text files. And then we can use exec command. And here in the exec part, we can basically, if the find command has suite bit enabled, we can basically exec rm minus rf, but yeah or anything like that, or reverse shell, or anything like that you want. So you should always check if any of your binaries on your system has suite bit enabled, uh, it should be disabled immediately because that's a really high uh, security vulnerability. Then we have SGIT bit. Um, it's similar to suite bit, but this means, but it is restricted to group. So uh, um, so same principle, but only in the group. Uh, we can see that this command here searches for the permissions, 4,000 and permissions 2,000. Permission 4,000 is suite bit, I think, and permission 2,000 is uh, JIT bit. Um, we, on our system, we should also disable core dumps. Why disable core dumps? Um, let's say that we have some web server um, running on our system, and then attacker has access to our logs, let's say. And he crashes somehow our server. And the core dumps basically can leak some potential the credentials of the server or something like that. So it's a good practice to disable core dumps on your Linux servers uh, to prevent such events from leaking the logs uh, with core dumps and your basically uh, secrets. Um, then on the Linux machines, we Linux machines we need to take care of the networking. Uh, this is done with IP tables. I would go into more details with that, but it's kind of time limited, so we won't uh, go into details. Um, then we we basically on the, the Linux servers we usually have some databases, uh, web servers like Nginx, Apache. All of these should be always checked for uh, potential vulnerabilities. Uh, you should you should basically at least check your configuration files. Um, how is it set up? Are the permissions uh, too open, too strict? Uh, and usually, which tool do we use to quickly find vulnerabilities in the, our machines is Limpis. Limpis is a very useful tool. It's a tool for the red teamers, but it can also be used for possible um, identification of misconfigurations and stuff like that because if it's useful for the red team, it's useful also for the blue team because if it gives information to the red team, how can they exploit us? It basically can give us also the information how we can protect our servers. Um, Limpis is really, really, really cool script. Uh, use it. it. It prints a lot of information about your system. Uh, but usually now, more and more, um, more services are dockerized, which is cool thing. Um, what do I mean by dockerized? We basically 
uh, isolate the processes on the system, uh, do not leak any information and share information or resources with the host system. Um, but Alej Brelich, here our talker, will <laughs> will explain a little bit in more details the containers and stuff like that, what is going on behind it. So I won't dive into details into that. Um, now, cool thing for Linux monitoring is also ODD. Um, what is ODD? Basically logs um, our kernel syscalls, um, accesses to the files. We can, we can actually try and quickly test it out. I have here an example. Um, it's already a name, okay. And here we can see that here is some audit CTL command, but we can also edit its configuration file. But this, this line basically adds a line to configuration file to, to basically log if there was any cat to the, uh, if, there, if there was any access to the Etsy password file. If there was, it will log it into the, its uh, logs, log systems. So if we execute this and add it, and now we basically go into log, uh, let's do that. Let's follow the log. And it is in slash var log audit dot log. And now let's get slash etsy password. And it basically logs it immediately into the console that we have access the um, slash etsy password file, um, you can see, which I know the block and this. And why am I even talking about this? Because then we can plug these log files into some CM solution, like Giga will explain how these things work. Um, uh, basically into, let's say, Splunk and then check the logs for faster querying and stuff like that in the Linux systems. Uh, this ODD is really fine because it's fast and quick and logs basically everything you specified in the config file. It's one setup and that's it. Um, kernel parameters, we will just briefly go through that because uh, we kind of don't have time. Uh, how do we set it? Why do we set them? Uh, these are basically um, ring zero parameters for the, our system. Um, they basically define core, core features of our system uh, where we disable, where we specify or we will be loading kernel modules, we'll be allowing uh, IP forwarding or stuff like that, what is usually disabled is like loading the modules, loading a different kernel on the system. Uh, we prevent users from doing that usually. It's good practice, I guess. Uh, protecting hard links, sync links, FIFOs. Uh, if you know what are FIFOs, these are special files in Linux which can communicate like, I don't know, communication pipes. Um, we should disable ICMP traffic, all of it, usually for ping not to work uh, to hide our server. Um, IP forwarding, like I said, disable it. Um, ARP, disable. And now we're back to the SSH hardening. Um, this we will go also briefly through it. Um, some cool options for SSH, not cool, but up to, to say, to, to harden up your SSH. Uh, you should not permit empty passwords, root login. Yeah, I guess it's cool if you allow it, but um, 
it's usually good practice not to allow uh, root users uh, on directly on the system and then I mean it's not that unsecure but it's still a good say, security option to do it that way. Uh, password authentication, don't use it on SSH, especially in this day and age where um, we have only automated bots on the internet and they are basically scanning your SSH uh, servers all the time, constantly. Um, so basically, rather use public keys if you must and don't even expose SSH to public if it's not necessarily. They limit it to IPs, I guess, IP ranges or something like that. Don't just expose it to the server because it is cool to have it a little bit more secure. Uh, then we here see that we can also specify which users can even also SSH into our server groups. Um, here we see that client, client live interval we have. Uh, what does this mean? That uh, after 300 seconds, the user will be prompt. After 300 seconds of inactivity, user will be prompt to uh, do something in the terminal. If in, he will not do anything, it will close the connection. This is also uh, a security measure because if I have some system administrator in my company and he leaves his terminal like that and goes to the lunch on the production server, and then if, I don't know, Franzka comes by and uh, uh, types here rm minus rf and then the production server goes down then well i think that he won't eat then did that day or something like that i don't know um, well uh, that's about ssh now how to protect ssh from automated attacks we could use uh, from from the bots. We could use fail to ban. Um, what is fail to ban? Fail to ban is um, a program which runs as daemon on our machine, um, and it basically logs the IPs that uh, try to connect to our SSH server and counts also the failure rates. Usually, if more than three failures are there present, it will block this IP for, let's say, 24 hours or something like that. Uh, it's all depending on the configuration, how you set it up. Um, and yeah, that's it. Um, about fail to how to install it. Basically, it's two simple commands. And now we have. Uh, Default fail to ban um, with those three limitations that I specified, and you can read the documentation for more, um, a little bit more fine grained uh, approach. But fail to ban is not only for SSH, you can use it for uh, also many, many other services like Nginx, but Nginx has better solutions than that, but okay. Um, just so you know that you can use many more uh, services with fail to ban. Um, so that's about it. About hardening, it was a little bit quick and fast. Uh, any questions about hardening part? Anything? I know it was a bit lost, but that's what I can do in 20 minutes. Um, so, okay, if there are no questions, uh, let's start with automation. Um, how do we usually install software on Linux machines? By executing, updating our repos, then installing a server. Here I'm installing a database, MariaDB, and then starting it and running the MySQL secure installation. But this is kind of time consuming if I have to do it on, let's say, 200 servers. Um, that's where Ansible comes into play. Uh, like, 
Ansible, what is Ansible? Ansible is a tool written in Python, which we configure it in our YAML file. Uh, we can see that we have some control node um, uh, and the inventory. Uh, in inventory, we specify our machines. Uh, we run it from the control node and all the managed nodes then basically uh, are managed by the control node. Um, and we configure it by use, writing YAML files and yeah, it's pretty fast and we can parallelize it on multiple machines, like I said, on N servers, as many as you wish. Um, now, how to get started with Ansible? It's basically, like I said, it's written in Python. Um, it's Python script, so it's available in pip. Um, now, how do we set up some server into our, env our inventory? We basically, it's again YAML file. We set here uh, the named uh, zones and then we say specify web server, we specify its IP, port, uh, username, and private key file location. Um, I can show you here some practical example of it. Um, here I have five machines currently. Uh, oh, is it? Uh, Basically, I have entered five machines into the, my inventory, and we can see that I have five Ubuntu servers, uh, each one with its own private key, IP, and that's how you basically put your machines into the inventory. Uh, now, how do we check our configuration if we have entered um, Sorry, sorry. If we have uh, basically set up our inventory collect, we basically just do Ansible all ping, and we can ping all the machines in our inventory. And let's check. And all the machines responded with pong, basically. So, yeah, we have access to all of the, our machines. Uh, now, what does it do in the background? We can check by increasing the verbosity of our commands. Uh, this is pretty fine for debugging, and now we can see that it firstly, what it does, it executes SSH command using Python, and we can see that, uh, like, um, where is it? Uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Um, well, it's basically Python wrapper that executes then SSH commands on our servers. Um, now, how do we actually go and write something for our to push on our servers? Um, we write something that's called the playbook. What is a playbook? Playbook is basically a set of commands um, like bash script, but it's a little bit more organized, allowing us uh, to have idempotence. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's like bash script and allowing us to automate all the tasks uh, like bash scripts and where we have written our commands inside of it. And if we go into the, our first playbook, which we will have written, um, here is like our, we name it, we, spe we edit a name, we specify to which host we want to push uh, our Ansible, and then here we have a simple ping my hosts, and then print message, hello world. This is a really simple playbook, and how do we run it? Let's say just on a single machine, Let's say Ansible playbook, inventory, Ubuntu first play. Let's run it on the first machine. Uh, and we can see that it successfully ran on this machine. Um, 
Now let's say that we wanted to install the database like we previously did, but a little bit more clean, I'd say. Um, we previously wanted to install database in simple lab commands like sudo apt update, install MariaDB server, uh, and then started the service. But then here I went and wrote a playbook. Um, uh, what it does basically, it's the same thing, but he can, here we can see that Ansible has a built-in plugin apt, which basically here predefines how we should update the apt. We update apt, install MariaDB server, uh, start MariaDB service, uh, Install expect command. This is a command which basically then runs our MariaDB prompt, which is my SQL Server installation. And this basically installs uh, MariaDB server on our server specified. And how do we basically then install it? We go Ansible playbook, inventory, well, then we don't, we basically don't limit it, install it on the all servers and go install database and it goes, here we can see all five servers and it runs it on basically all the servers. I will just cancel it because it's not necessarily now useful to do that, but here's how you see it. It's very quick, simple, easy to use. Uh, use it, ChatGPT writes YAML perfectly, so you don't need to <laughs> take care of that, just check it if uh, your YAML is correct, and that's it. Uh, now, uh, what should we also check quickly before I finish with the talk? Um, is Ansible uh, hardening uh, role? Uh, this role basically we used it at the um, some exercise, and this is how I got to uh, be, to this role and how I started using it and why I started using it because of some exercise we had. In, yeah, um, and I will just quickly show what is in this role. We basically what what we covered in the few first slides, and if we go to the roles. And OS hardening, where we have tasks and we have hardening YAML here. Where is it? Uh, where is this task? Hardening YAML. Is this OS hardening? Yeah. We can see that basically it imports tasks for Audit D. What does this do? It installs Audit D and it enables logs. This is some online role already written from, uh, for us, uh, and we can use it freely. Um, so if we check it, it basically just installs ODD and copies default ODD command, uh, copies the default ODD uh, configuration file to the. Uh, servers, uh, we have cron tasks, basically usually it's good to disable cron, uh, limits, login definitions, this is to basically how banner should display or how many users should log in and stuff like that. Um, minimizing access permissions, that was about files which I was talking about to you, like suite bit, um, uh, writable permissions and stuff like that. Uh, PAM, this is a plugin uh, for authentication, which we didn't talk about it, but yeah. Uh, mod probe, uh, security stuff, uh, sysctotl, um, R hosts, uh, and stuff like that. Basically, this is a hardening role which you can run on your Linux server to, server to basically do whatever I talked first 20 minutes about, like uh, checking if the files are writable, suite bits, um, 
and things like that. It basically, this role does everything for us, so we don't need to worry about it. Uh, and this kind of concludes this talk. Um, hope you got at least some knowledge. I know it's a half hour and we cannot do everything in this half hour. So I basically just went through it. I hope that you will look into this stuff. I know that I didn't explain it as detailed as it should be, but I hope that you will at least look into stuff um, and protect your own servers a little bit more efficiently and maybe start using Ansible because it's really cool. Um, basically, I manage all my servers with Ansible. Uh, set up uh, your playbooks to, and you have, if you crash your server somehow, you can have it back up in like two minutes again. And that's basically it. So, firstly, when you write the playbook, you're like, oh no, fuck, this will be so much time consuming and something like that. But once you have written your playbooks, you can basically rerun them anytime you want and you will be thankful that you did that because now you don't have to spend two days setting back up the servers. Instead, you just set it up in two minutes. Um, that's it for this talk. Any questions? Okay. So before I leave, sh shameless self-promotion, join Dragon's Egg because we are cool. I don't know, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it.